Obviously, the G20 meeting is probably the least important thing happening at the G20 meeting. Uh, the most important, uh, President uh, Donald Trump meeting with President Xi Jinping talking about trade. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of damage in the data yet, although the OECD did report this week that global trade fell off uh, quite a bit in the third quarter. Uh, is, is that a canary in a coal mine, or is this maybe overblown as an economic issue for the world? Uh, I think we are seeing already rather drastic impact. And I'll give you a very fast example. Six months ago, in May, we projected that the growth for 2019 was going to be 3.9% or something like that. that maybe, maybe it was to be scratching global 4%. Growth. Global growth, world growth, 3.9%, scratching 4%. Okay? We just put out last week, only six months later, a projection that says for 2019 and 2020, we're going to grow 3.5%. We shaved off 0 0.4, 0 0.5%, half a point. In six months' time. So I called in my economist. I said, what happened? I said, well, all the downside risks materialized. And that's the trade tensions. And remember, trade is now growing at 3%. It was already growing at 5% per year at end of last year. It should be growing at 7 to 8%. So it's lost in momentum. But then you invest to produce, and you produce to sell. If you're not sure that you're going to sell, that you have the access or at what price you're going to sell, then you don't invest. And investment is the seed of tomorrow's growth. So basically, what you have is this very clear explanation of why it is that the world economy is now decelerating. We're in a slowdown. Well, who suffers the most, China, the U.S., or collateral damage, emerging markets, other countries? The United States is the most uh, self-sufficient country in the world. It is the one for which uh, trade is perhaps uh, a relatively modest part of its GDP. You know, the, the consumption, the investment, the generation within the United States is just very, very uh, big. And therefore, in a trade tension like the one we have today, um, the United States would probably have less of an impact in the short term. But in the end, with the United States being also the world's largest foreign investor and with the, you know, the less sales worldwide, the companies will have less profits, uh, you know, the, 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 the impact really eventually ends up hitting everybody and affecting everybody. Well, uh, who outside of the U.S. and China is most at risk? Oh, um, when the two largest economies in the world um, are at odds with each other on something like trade or now some investment con considerations, some investment policies. The whole world uh, suffers as a spillover. But also there are issues with Europe. We have this decision on whether they're going to be or not taxes on cars, for example. Now, that directly affects Europe and it affects expectations, but also it affects about... 10, perhaps 15 countries that you don't have very much present when you talk about cars? Central Europe and Eastern Europe and even, you know, countries like Spain, whatever, that produce parts, but that produce the tens of thousands of jobs, hundreds of thousands of jobs that are depending on the global value chains that have been formed. If those global value chains are interrupted, then there's a very serious impact. Well, President Trump gets a lot of criticism for his views of economics and the utility of tariffs, but does he have a point about China cheating on trade? I think the question is the way in which you address the differences. Um, and this is perhaps the greatest concern and the greatest, I would say, the, 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 I would say the, the chorus that is coming out and saying, let's discuss the issues. Let's talk about the issues. Let's talk about, you know, document the consequences. What is happening? Why? And uh, this is why there's so much hope and expectation in this uh, uh, meeting between the president of China and the president of uh, the United States. But I'll, I'll give you an example of what happened recently. Uh, there's a big problem with excess capacity on steel. 
in the world. And in Hangzhou, in 2016, the G20 decided to create a global forum to deal with the question of excess capacity on steel. The OECD was asked to be the facilitator of that mechanism. And we were working very hard at it and trying to, you know, dismantle capacity, et cetera. And then, boom, come the tariffs on steel. And, of course, then you say, well, is it worth going into a negotiated <laughs> arrangement of the substance of the problem when basically the tariffs will only deal with the superstructure of the problem because they don't deal with the dismantlement of, of the, the actual capacity that is, that is surplus today. We know for the next 10 years, demand will not solve the, the, the problem of excess capacity. Therefore, there has to be a, a, a negotiation that actually deals with the substance of the problem. And so this is the question of, you know, we created some mechanisms ourselves, which is a negotiated way. This is, we believe, the better way. So speaking of uh, supply and demand, Vladimir Putin's going to meet with Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, in theory, they will probably talk about oil prices. Putin said $60 a barrel is okay with him, but we're in the 50s now. Is this a benefit to the world, or do you expect oil prices to go back up, that maybe they make some kind of production deal? The world is now adjusting to a new reality, and that is a very, very important increase in the U.S. capacity to produce oil, and not only the oil it's actually putting out, uh, but, you know, remember that it, it used to, the oil market used to depend on how much the United States would import, and now, well, it happens to be that they no longer uh, and, you know, the, the, the things like that happen in the Middle East, for example. Israel mm -hmm. was a great importer of energy, and now they're going to be an exporter of energy because of the gas finding. So the equation of the supply and demand has changed. And now the question is whether, you know, tomorrow, whether Saudi Arabia will cut one million barrels or increase one million barrels, depending on whether it goes up too fast or goes down too fast. I think there is a fundamental shift in the supply and demand. And second, there is a fundamental shift also in terms of consumption. And that is something which has to be taken into consideration going forward. There's also a uh, production of the world that is going to be less fuel intensive going forward. That's also something to take into consideration.